There are 336 million menstruating women in India, of which 36% use disposable sanitary napkins. That totals to 121 million women according to the Menstrual Hygiene Alliance of India. The number of sanitary napkins used per menstrual cycle at a conservative aid, and calculating that for the year, implies that India has 12.3 billion disposable sanitary napkins to take care of every year, majority of which are not biodegradable. With not enough effort going into stripping used sanitary napkins so that the richness of the nutrients can be captured through composting, menstrual waste is disposed as part of routine waste, it ends up in landfills, is thrown in open spaces and water bodies, burned, buried or flushed down toilets. Each poses a different type of risk to the environment. In order to implement better waste management solutions, there is first the challenge of destigmatizing menstruation to create spaces where women have access to resources and can discuss their periods without any guilt or shame. This week we look into period poverty in India and a social enterprise that has for 10 years worked to tackle all of these different challenges. This week's episode on Amplify. Today we are speaking to Kathy Walkling and Yesameen Medima, who are the co founders of the social enterprise called Ecofem. Started in 2010 and based in Oroville, their goal is to create environmental and social change through revitalizing menstrual practices that are healthy, environmentally sustainable, culturally responsive, and empowering. They produce and sell washable, reusable cloth pads and provide menstrual health education. So hi, and thank you so much for being on my episode. You're welcome. Hi. <laughs> thank you for having us. <laughs> no worries. I'm so glad that you guys are calling in all the way from Oroville and you found time to do this during these unprecedented, weird, historic moments. So mm-hmm. thank you so much. So my first question to you is just to get an understanding of what was the turning point for you? When did you recognize or, or see that there was a need to address the issue of menstrual waste and sort of start Ecofem? I can start perhaps because it was really a very, very clear moment for me. And I think it was pretty much the time when I kind of reached India and an Oroville and got and asked where I should dispose of my sanitary waste, you know, assuming that I would get a reasonable answer like I had everywhere else in the world, which is there's a bin over there and you just put it in. (laughs) But in fact, I was given a a mumpty, a digging tool instead and told that I could go and dig a hole over under the bushes and under the trees to bury my sanitary waste. And it was like a real kind of aha moment for me that, you know, there is no simple disposal solution for sanitary waste and I think that was anyway sort of obvious to me visibly just looking around it in India but just having that experience really brought it home for me so that was I think my sort of epiphany moment where I knew that at least I needed to do something differently around my use of menstrual products because it was clear there was no waste disposal solution. Yeah for me I mean I was when we started Ecofem, that was for me when I just reached or- Oroville and um, Kathy invited me to think along for sort of livelihood options for women. And cloth pads was one of them. And it was a very logical choice for me because I'd made pads myself. And later thinking, uh, actually, my mother had been teaching uh, young girls uh, to stitch their own cloth pads. I-, I grew up in Indonesia. She did that there with, with girls who didn't have access to any sort of uh, products. And um, I think the environmental piece has always been sort of a given and uh, not sort of much thought about. And it was also the sort of potential that had brought, you know, the sort of other scope that this product also had. So it was, it was also sort of the livelihood piece and, um, and uh, the empowerment piece. And so there were all these sort of other additional things that I think made this project very uh, attractive. Yeah. And I know that, Plastic is a very common ingredient in pads and tampons. And why is it such a common ingredient when a lot of people who produce these uh, products are fully aware of the harmful impact of plastic? Well, 
I'm not so sure whether people were so aware of the harmful impact. I think plastic is also a relatively sort of new substance and uh, and people were experimenting in its applications and it, there's so many sort of different forms. And in, for this product, yeah, it started off with cotton, with cotton bandages and gradually needed a leak proof layer. And then it could be replaced by other sort of forms of plastic that were either more absorbent and very it's very lightweight. And so I think the advantages were very clear in the big sort of like while developing it and the disadvantages also of the waste were maybe not so you know were not so clear they were not so uh, on the, it's only much more recent that we're also having through having access to the internet it is also that we are able to spread these the information the research that has been done on on how harmful these plastics are to our body and uh, and so before that, we, I think we were all sort of really uh, living in a quite a, <laughs> in a void of that sort of information. We had, uh, I think, very few of us really knew anything uh, about it. Yeah, and I would just add that I actually think that most people, I mean, this may be changing, but certainly when we started, most people were completely unaware of that plastic was really a common ingredient in pads and tampons in India when we spoke to them, you know, we would ask the question, do you know what's in your sanitary napkin? And almost everybody would say cotton. And so I think it wasn't so obvious actually that people willingly and, and knowingly used plastic pads. It's um, something that I think has become much more visible and in the sort of through activists bringing more awareness to this issue of the ingredients in disposable pads but this is very very recent most people I think had no idea that's really interesting it's also something found out ourselves through sort of jumping into this work that I mean I knew it wasn't you know plastic is not great for the environment but I wasn't aware that the estimate is that, that it takes 500 to 800 years to decompose a disposable sanitary napkin and so these are sort of numbers that are so incredibly shocking and, and they're very different for maybe other plastic products that can be recycled. And these products, because they're sort of made from composite plastics, they cannot be recycled or extremely hard to do that. So it, it, it has its own sort of, uh, also its own sort of story in that, in, 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 in the environmental piece. Yeah, and all of the products that you make are um, reusable uh, well they're made out of cotton and the pads themselves are reusable and washable and i looked apart from the regular sort of um, design of pads you also have uh, pads that have that can be used to like tie around as a belt and you have diy pad kits and and i just wanted to know what was the inspiration behind these specific kind of products like what was the line of thinking behind making these products accessible Mm. Yeah, we started out doing research, really. I mean, to be honest, we were quite convinced in the beginning that we wanted to make a product that would be available commercially, you know, to women in, you know, that could buy them in regular shops and online. But we weren't sure how rural women would respond to cloth pads. And we also had the assumption in the beginning that most rural women were also just using plain cloth. And because our personal motivation was much more on the environment side, it really was a genuine question whether there was even a necessity to offer cloth pads to rural women if they were successfully using cloth anyway. So we started doing a fair bit of research to understand, obviously, the knowledge and attitudes and practices around menstruation. Then we learned actually how prevalent the use of disposables were among rural women. So we then started to also apply. And another thing that really was interesting for us too is that we knew that this idea of drying menstrual cloth in the sun and in a place that would be visible to others was likely to be problematic because it was problematic for how they managed just the traditional cloth. So with that in mind, that's what really started us researching alternative designs such as the belt model. And that was another thing too. We'd heard women don't wear underwear. So you know, with these sorts of information in mind, like the not wearing underwear, not um, being able to dry a place, a pad in a visible place, we we tried different designs. So that's what led to the belt pad design, and also a foldable model pad, which is actually quite popular among rural women because it dries really quickly and looks like a handkerchief on the line. So this was all just really taking the information that we knew about women and their preferences and lifestyles and culture and the beliefs and around 
you know, nobody should see this or that or whatever. So with that in mind, that's how we came up with these different models and we tested them. And to be perfectly honest, we found that it was quite difficult to get really takers for the belt model pad. And I think that's actually because more women use underwear than we had imagined. But it's still there as a pad option. But the foldable model has proven to be really popular, I think, because of its discretion when drying mostly. And the do-it-yourself pad, I don't know, do you want to speak to that, yes, Yasmin? Uh, the do-it-yourself, I mean... I think one of the things that we really want to do is to make cloth pads accessible to everybody. And so if price is uh, really an inhibition to people, then the do it yourself, it's something, okay, we provide the materials that are, you know, really good to make a pad out of and you can stitch your own pad and it costs you much less. And also with this idea that once you've done it, you see how simple it is and you can make it from different sort of other materials. So that was really what was behind making a do-it-yourself kit. It's also the other thing that we also in the work is that sometimes it's, um, we often do workshops when we have groups over. If they have time, then we sit together and we stitch a pad. And I think this topic of menstruation often, you know, on the surface, it might be just for many people, either a health issue or uh, an environmental or, uh, but often it's it's got many layers. And um so to sit and to make something for yourself, and especially when we have a sort of a difficult relationship with menstruation, if we've been taught that it's something that's dirty or um, not okay or to be ashamed of, and then to actually make something with, uh, yeah, with your hands and with your heart for yourself or for somebody else, it's a very sort of a beautiful activity. Yeah. And I like that you talked a little bit about the sort of underlying cultural issues or, or, the under, or the implications of menstruation and the conversations that we've grown up with around it. And, and I'm just curious to know what were the ideas and notions that you, around menstruation that you both grew up with? Mm. <laughs> yeah, I think it's very different for Yasmin and I actually, we've talked about it a lot, but for me, it was really, I mean, it, the whole basic idea was that it was very private Nobody should know that you're menstruating, not even really something to talk about. And, you know, I definitely inherited a kind of feeling of shame and embarrassment around menstruation, which really led to a sort of feeling that it had to be concealed from everybody. Um, and it would be the worst possible thing that could probably happen would be maybe to leak, you know, and to be visibly show that I'm menstruating. So I think I just absorbed all of that very naturally and organically from the culture. Yes, I mean, yeah. I think in Dutch culture in general, also there's, um, you know, it's it's a it's a topic that you can talk about, but at the same time, also it's not so much talked about. And though, for example, in my own family, there are no inhibitions around this at all, and there's no, you know, I've not been taught any sort of shame around menstruation by my mother in any sort of way. At the same time, I think it's the larger environment that really sort of influences us too, and. It's like Kathy said, it's, uh, the, it was terrible at school when you would see your friend who would leak through her pants or you'd just feel sort of sorry for them and <laughs> had to warn them. And, and it, yeah, I find that quite sort of fascinating that, that we can be so, you know, in the mind or maybe just sort of uh, not getting it from home, but that at the same time just sort of absorb all of that without anybody ever sort of really telling you that you should be ashamed about it and it's a bad thing or whatever, that anyway it's sort of, persist you know like that that it um, that it continues this sort of notion around uh, menstruation yeah there's definitely i can also see it with my own children like in the beginning there's well of course i do not have that conversation at home that it's a dirty practice this sort of first reaction is like wow yuck what is that oh that blood and and so it's like you know like a sort of an inner first reaction that that's something that is dirty and uh, i don't know where that really sort of comes from i mean it might also for them also be the larger environment where something like that has somehow uh, penetrated but uh, yeah it's it's curious how we maintain uh, these notions yeah so both of your experiences are from the global north but Speaking as somebody who grew up in a country like India, there's definitely this in this culture of secrecy that sort of translates into shame that you end up internalizing around your mm -hmm. periods. 
And I think this conversation sort of now come back into the fore with issues like Sabri Mala that was happening where mm. you know, women were essentially protesting for the right to enter the sacred temple when they were menstruating. So, you, so, you know, it's, it's been quite a contentious bone for a lot of people in India. And mm. what were some of the, like, apart from the fact that you grew up with certain notions around it, what, what was something that surprised you or that perhaps didn't surprise you when you started the conversation on menstruation in India? I mean, I think kind of everything surprised me in the beginning. I, I couldn't have anticipated just to what an extent menstruation was a taboo. So, you know, we were in for a, a steep learning curve when we started doing research and having conversations and learning all the sorts of practices that women were supposed to observe or not observe when they had their menstruation. And I mean, you've just touched on one about, you know, Sabari Mala and not going to temple, obviously not going kitchen, touching food ritual seclusion um, that was still quite commonly practiced and you know all the things that a woman it's I mean this is particularly in Tamil Nadu I think but I think there are variants of this across the country but certain things that you know you're not supposed to do which are all rooted in this idea of impurity and I think this whole sort of set of behaviors was really surprising for me like I it was one thing for me to sort of understand you know that it sort of there'll be a belief you know, that there's certain maybe attitudes, soft attitudes of maybe shame and secrecy, but that it got translated in such codified ways in the culture was really something that I really had, you know, a lot to learn about. Yeah. I think one of the things that really surprised me is sort of getting a, a feeling for how large this taboo was, was at the same time also how easy it was to talk about menstruation if you would set the settings for it. And mm -hmm. so that... You know, it's a, a very strange sort of, you'd think, okay, if it's the taboo and you can't speak about it, then it must be hard to speak about it. But the reality is not like that. If you uh, bring a group of women together or girls together to speak about menstruation, a very lively, generally a very lively conversation sort of comes from that. Or uh, at least questions or and curiosity and willingness, you know, there's an eagerness to sort of learn about it. And that has a lot of potential. I mean, I think that's, uh, that's really, um, yeah, that gives sort of, hope that we can change things around how we feel about menstruation. Yeah. And have you found that sense of curiosity and, and that context for that conversation to occur with um, initiatives that Ecofem has created like Pad for Pad and Pad for Sisters? Yes. It's been a great openness for these kind of conversations. And so the Pad for Pad and Pads for Sisters programs are operating more with women and girls from low income backgrounds. And you know, they often haven't had a lot of necessarily access to education. So the whole topic of menstruation and even the body and what is this process and what's going on for them was has been, you know, revelatory for so, so many women. Like it's been actually surprising, I think, as well, to the extent to which it's been neglected as, a, as an educational subject and conversation in formal education. So you know, I think I was really quite surprised in the beginning um, just how little even, you know, women and mothers knew. So if they're poorly educated, obviously they can't talk about it to their girls. So the kind of education that gets passed on had been things like, you know, don't go to temple, don't touch this, don't touch that, you know, don't talk to boys. And I mean, that's what kind of education girls typically get around menstruation. And of course, there's far more to it than that. And so, you know, just setting up a space where one can sort of really talk about the process of menstruation and give proper education and show, you know, images that they can understand and situate this process in the body and in the reproductive cycle processes and, you know, just to help women and girls make sense of it and really reframe it in a much more positive and life-giving way, you know, like taking the, the, the judgment off it and just like, what is this experience? This is pretty much at the root of what we do through these programs. And, you know, I think these are really, you know, participants are just simply very happy and grateful to be able to get factual, useful information, you know, that also includes how to look after themselves when they're menstruating and maybe different remedies for alleviating pain, understanding it as part of a bigger cycle of fertility. And all of this seems to be so sort of, 
you know, really foundational information and women and girls and, and even boys and men, whenever we've done sessions with them, they really are very, very grateful and happy to have this information. Like it's been really, I think the silence around menstruation means that this fundamental understanding has been really lacking and that's something that we've been able to address through our work. Yeah, and I think it's particularly interesting if you're able to hold these conversations with male members or, or men in general, because a lot of communities that you're working with, and just sort of generally, I think, across India, purchasing decisions and, and financial mm. prowess or financial independence tends to rest with the male members of the family. Mm. And to, to that extent, and the experience that you've had speaking to men, what what role do you think they can play in destigmatizing menstruation? Yes, I think a very large role. It's sort of the, if you even just in general talk about the opening of this conversation, it's not only the opening of this conversation between uh, with girls and women, but also with men. It's in, in, in sort of wider society. And so, like so many sort of men say, I've got a sister or I've got a daughter or, or a wife or a mother or a girlfriend. And so also for men to understand what's going on, how they can help to support maybe their daughters or women or in making also choices that are good for them. Yeah, I think this, this sort of enlarges the sort of support basis to make choices that you feel are right for you. Even if it's just, you know, by just talking and, and normalizing a conversation, it makes it also maybe easier to hang up that pad to dry in a family where you're maybe living with, with more than just a, your father maybe in an extended family or and yeah it's a sort of a in everything it's not only related to this but i mean i think in general in life if, if we can all sort of be part of conversations and decision making it can we can all be a support to to one another and especially uh, i think in this topic where men are being kept out of the conversation and where mm. often they share that they actually would like to be part of the conversation because they 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 feel though they are not menstruating themselves they have a, also a stake in this and mm. even if you talk just about maybe uh, environment you'd say okay the world is ours it's not uh, <laughs> you know yeah 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 and i mean i don't know if you guys have learned any, picked up on any Hindi while you've, you've been here, or um, if you have and you have any interest towards uh, Bollywood movies, but recently there was this film that came out which is called Padman, and it's based on a real life story of yeah. this man who actually was mo so moved by the fact that menstruation is so stigmatized in his own household that he started making his own pads. And as inspiring as Arunachalam Murganathan, I think that's what his name is, story is. The film, of course, um, took on a very different role where, I mean, in my opinion, um, it's sort of like the conversation of our menstruation almost excluded the people uh, who experience it. And I was just wondering, what are your thoughts on, on, on movies like that? Do they, do they help propel the conversation or um, what, what do you think? I mean, I think Pat, uh, Pat and really brought a lot of visibility globally to menstruation and I think to the sort of, you know, situation that many women in India may face in terms of access to products and, you know, the shame and stigma that's really part of it. So, you know, it had its place. But again, I think these conversations, you know, for them to be really valuable, they need to go a little bit deeper and to be a bit more reflective. And, you know, like you've got your critiques about it. And I think for us too, I think that the whole approach, what he did, I mean, he, you know, I think in a way, you know, I have a lot of respect for what Morganathan has done. But at the same time, it, you know, he ob obviously his product is, is a disposable pad. And so, you know, the question sometimes is what's left out of the conversation. And, you know, he got elevated as a kind of superstar really <laughs> through that. He's made a, a contribution, but I think, you know, we shouldn't sort of get hypnotised by these things and, you know, learn to sort of ask maybe deeper questions. It's maybe about what, what isn't being said rather than, you know, and I wouldn't sort of want to distract 
from what he's done. But I, so I think overall it's a positive message. But I think what was interesting was what happened afterwards too. And there was sort of this Padman challenge where people were sort of posting selfies of themselves holding a pad, you know, <laughs> to in a way express themselves or show themselves as being, you know, period advocates and, and, and you know, and activists. And, yeah. and, you know, when that led to another sort of interesting thing what we observed which was that a couple of people picked up the idea of you know what about reusable and sustainable pads as part of this challenge you know is Padman challenge just about promoting his machine and his approach to solving this problem or is it something bigger so I think that that momentum of the sort of Padman challenge was quite interesting it went in novel directions which were were quite interesting I would say yeah um, yes, yeah, Amin, do you want to add something to that, perhaps? No, I feel very similar to Kathy about that particular movie. And I think it, he really opened an immense conversation across and, and roped in, of course, also our role models in a way, our, our movie stars, because also many of the people, I mean, uh, even the, the Padman Challenge also involved a lot of movie stars, um, as well as, let's sort of say, common people to post. But that made it... Um, I mean, topic was already quite on the agenda, but it made it sort of really peak and helpful, I think, in that way for bringing it to the attention of many people of how big an issue it is um, to have access and, and maybe also choice of, of, of products. Yeah, and I, I think it's quite interesting that you brought up the social media challenge because I remember when everybody was sort of just posting smiling selfies of themselves with a pad, you know, and a disposable. <laughs> and I remember, like... I understand, of course, the momentum behind it, but I think it was also quite superficial. And I, I remember there was this uh, particular image as well of uh, Akshay Kumar, who was, the, who was the producer, I think, uh, but he was definitely the actor in the film. And um, he was like, you know, sort of giving this speech about the importance of destigmatizing, destigmatizing menstruation, sorry, to this uh, group of students who are part of the ABVP organization in Delhi. And they were all all boys and I and and I was like oh, okay so, you know, it's, it's quite like a, it's, it's quite a superficial engagement and yeah and I don't think that it necessarily tackled the issues like the real issues at hand and not to mention even in the movie like the female characters were just like sort of relegated to a very secondary status so yeah it, it definitely mm. give a feeling of men have come to save the world yes exactly <laughs> exactly <laughs> Yeah, it was like a very savior complex element to the film. And I'm like, okay, Akshay, it's not like you're actually menstruating, even though you're trying to simulate the process in the film. <laughs> and to that end, in India, when we talk a little bit about policy measures, the government has actually removed the 12% tax on sanitary products. But in a lot of countries globally, the taxes sort of continue to exist. And in fact, sanitary pads and tampons are, are actually seen as luxury items, you know. So I, I just wanted to get your thoughts on this, on, on what other policy measures or initiatives do we need to take to tackle period poverty and, and sort of make it more accessible? Yeah, I, I think I it's, mean, what, it's, um, the, um, what I find interesting about the, the taxes also that it's Somehow we had assumed that if you don't put any taxes on, a, on, on pads, that it would actually bring down the prices of um, um, sanitary pads and make it more accessible. And so recently there was a, a review of that across nations in the world that have done that, where actually that result is very minimal. Either the prices have not reduced at all or very little. And that is, I mean, there are a few sort of reasons for that, that often, for example, the, the, the taxes on the raw materials are not cannot be sort of deducted afterwards and also issues of access like what do the logistics look like of the product how uh, far does it need to be transported into uh, remote areas or not but anyway in short it hasn't always sort of come to uh, and most of the cases not come to a reduction of price I think there's also another piece and you're right period poverty is becoming really topical all over the world but I think one of the <laughs> the, the best ways to address period poverty is also to really make much more visible the availability of reusable products because this is where one saves money as well. 
And and this is the challenge. It's a challenge for a small company like Ecofem, but you know, all the alternative, I call them alternative products, reusable products, I mean, they're not getting still much mainstream legitimacy. So, you know, we're not Procter and Gamble or Johnson Johnson with big advertising budgets. So, you know, there's still a tilt in the world towards promoting these products as if they're the only kind of menstrual products available. And I personally feel, you know, a big shift can happen when women and girls menstruators are given a fair access to to information about what their options are, including the fact that most of the reusable products end up becoming significantly cost saving. So I think, for example, in the UK, they're doing a really interesting approach and the government is behind this too, where they're actually investing in education in schools where, you know, students are getting exposed to the various menstrual products that are out there and, and analysing them, including cost savings. So I think this is, you know, another dimension of it, that period poverty is not just necessarily a function of, you know, dropping taxes or dropping the price of the products. I think it can be as much about educating about alternatives that are also really cost saving. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's an interesting point because a lot of times, like sometimes the conversation might be actually limited to the fact that these products are taxed and, and they may not be inclusive of all the other measures that you can take and then they sort of have to go hand in hand. So, so yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I wanted to talk a little bit as well on, to bring it back to India, I wanted to talk a little bit about convenience. So the way that I see it, right, and correct me if I'm wrong, convenience mm. for women in, in rural communities, like the ones that you work with, means the, the ease with which they have access to such products and the ease with which they are exposed to or can be a part of outreach initiatives such as yours. And on the other hand, convenience in urban India, like cities in Mumbai and uh, cities like Mumbai, Bangalore, Delhi, etc., convenience can perhaps just mean not confronting the issue so of, of easy disposability because, you know, menstrual waste or waste in general is not something we have to segregate ourselves and get rid of. It is um, the waste picker's job, you know. So it's something mm. that that's sort of happening and it's getting it's getting cleared up and we're not in in any way involved in that process. And I just wanted to understand that how would you get Ecofem's message across to a specific, this specific set of people for, for urban Indian women for whom convenience may, may be similar, Mm. maybe synonymous with avoidance. Mm. It's a very good question. And you're really right that the messaging can be really different depending on who we're speaking to. (laughs) So, you know, we're thinking urban areas and perhaps maybe this is something someone might want to speak more to. But, you know, the main thing there is really help unpacking the the myth of, well, this idea that convenience means that, you know, I should be able to just use and throw and not have to deal with the waste. I think you're right that rural women tend to be much more willing and accepting of the of, of washing a cloth pad, for example, and not sort of balking at that. Whereas in urban areas, the women are much more like, ooh, you know, <laughs> expecting yeah. to wash it or whatever. So, you know, that, that for urban women, and actually with both, we'll really spend time to also break down how do you wash and really showing the simple steps that are involved. But yeah, the access is, of course, different in urban areas. Women, I think, generally do get easy access, whereas and it's a challenge for us too with Ecofem is how to actually reach out to these women in, in remote areas, in villages. And, you know, when this requires, you know, different kind of strategies, largely working through rural partners and NGOs. And then the conversation is also much more, I think, about not just, you know, how do you sort of use the cloth pad or whatever, but it it also with rural women will really spend a bit more time usually on just the whole conversation around what is menstruation and why is it and, you know, and having these conversations around about culture and about this perception of being, you know, impure and bad things will happen if I don't follow these practices. We usually go into much more depth with rural women about that because, you know, it's necessary. We see that they just simply haven't even had often a basic education around what's the, you know, what this process is, this menstrual process is about. So, you know, we tend to embed these conversations about the pads in a much bigger conversation around menstrual process. And 
you know, and the women like in rural areas. For example, one thing that really surprised me was learning that often rural women, after if, if they're using a disposable pad, they'll actually wash it before, or not all of them, but many of them will wash it before they'll then bury it or burn it. And, you know, this is quite a lot of work. I mean, you can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. <laughs> you know, there's some way in which, and, and then they've got to kind of go and find a place where they can dig a hole and bury it or if they burn it, you know. So they're often, you know, not actually as bothered by this idea of washing and drying. I mean, the drying thing can be challenging from the point of view of this belief that nobody should see them, the cloth pad, but they're, like I said earlier, the design of the foldable pad makes that not so problematic. So, yeah, a long answer, but, yeah, there are definitely differences in, in approach, how we approach, and or, that are rooted in, I think, the different kind of conditioning that, you know, broadly speaking, that these different groups have. Yeah. Yeah. And if we talk about, for example, the, com the group that we reach out for our commercial sales, they're largely urban. And so somehow something spoke to them. I mean, there's so many sort of different sort of aspects of it, of whether it's health and uh, many uh, girls who are, or women who experience rashes by using plastic pads and to looking for an alternative for that. Uh, or knowing what's in disposable sanitary pads and, and not wanting to hold that against their bodies uh, anymore, or whether it's the environmental piece, um, the, despite living maybe in the city and being sort of far away from the actual disposal and the people who are handling it uh, being very concerned about that, especially when they also learn that it can take such a long time to decompose the, the sanitary uh, uh, pads. Connecting to yourself through, uh, you know, when you're taking care of your pad, you're washing your blood, sort of that, that, that piece that we spoke about before. So these are different sort of elements that could either in a combination uh, be a reason for people to uh, want to make a switch and for that to forego the convenience of just throwing. Yeah. yeah. And since we're talking about disposability as well, and you talked a little bit about how long your pads um, last and and based on the research that I did on you, I know that you, women who purchase this EcoFem pads can use it up to for five years. And I was just curious to know what happens after the pads have sort of lived their life. Yeah. So the, the pads are made of three different layers. You have the top layer, which is organic cotton. It's a flannel absorbent cotton. And inside there are also flannel uh, organic cotton layers uh, for the absorption of the blood and then at the backing there is cotton that has been laminated with a leak proof layer it's called a PUL polyurethane laminate that is actually a plastic it's a very thin layer of plastic and that makes the product that particular layer uh, not a uh, compostable and so at the end of, of the life of that pad that could be 75 washes or much more depending on whether you could take good care of it ideally you would take your pad apart and you could put the cotton with your organic waste, it will uh, decompose. And that little layer, that backing layer is, it's mixed waste. It will go to a landfill. Okay. And yeah, so it's, that's that aspect of it. But we, we made that decision um, to sort of use a leak proof layer because for many women, it's such a critical element in order to make that choice to use cloth pads instead of disposable sanitary napkins. And um, yeah, weighing that on a scale, you say, okay, one pad can at least replace 75 plastic pads. So that, that's a very large environmental gain. Yeah. And do you think that, because I know that now sort of menstrual cup is sort of bringing up as an as a, a alternative, as an eco-friendly alternative. But of course, the thing with the menstrual cup is that you then have to insert it. And it, it can, it's actually a much more intimate process as opposed to say, if you were to put a pad on, do, do you think the menstrual cup would actually sort of gain traction, gain more popularity and, and actually be something that women in India use on a more frequent basis? I think it's already growing very, very hard, uh, very fast. I mean, when we started with cloth pads, there was one cup producer in India and now there are maybe 12 or 14 cup makers. And so it's definitely gaining popularity and social media has really helped a lot because that just sort of helped the word of mouth uh, messaging that is, I think, very uh, powerful for these sort of products. And there's definitely space for it. 
if you know of people who are using an internal product, they're also maybe some, in some form a role model for you. You might not be so intimidated to also use. I mean, in the West, internal products are the most popular products. So I think there is in India, I mean, <laughs> with so many girls and women of menstruating age, there's an enormous place for it. Yeah. And I wanted to know, because we're in, of course, amidst the pandemic, I wanted to know what the impact of COVID-19 has been on your business and, and how are you coping with it as business owners? Yeah. So for us, we had to stop. We had to close down. So a large part of our commercial sales is also international. That already stopped when we were still sort of functioning as an office, that the, the international flights had stopped so we could not send parcels anymore and then little by bit a little everything closed down and of course our, we couldn't do our education with girls and women and not our distribution to partners and so we all sort of uh, work half time now from home and do some back-end work but there is no um, sort of activity in the field nor is there any sort of commercial interaction Though there has actually been a widening of what is called essential, including hygiene products. And so we're hoping that we would be able to at least get some of uh, the distribution going again soon. Yeah. And, you know, just sort of to end on a, on a more uh, broader note, um, what does sustainability mean to each of you? Well, for me, it is, it's things like, you know, translates into really trying to live a simple lifestyle and really ask myself what do I actually need versus what do I want and really trying to consciously choose products and things that do not harm the earth as much as is really possible and you know to start to think about things so for example when I go shopping I would you know look at the packaging and you know look if there's something if I could get the same without packaging I would choose that I mean there's so many ways in which that translates but I think it's really this sort of ethic of living you know, simply um, with the awareness that Earth is finite and we're, you know, we're straining our presence on the Earth and trying to live, you know, a simple life that doesn't, you know, excessively use anything. Yeah. Yeah, I feel very similar. It's really sort of living, we're part of this nature and we're really impacting it very strongly and to try to do that uh, as little as possible and to be sort of, conscious of that in all the sort of life choices that we make and like last year I I decided that I wouldn't do any domestic flights and or this year we were going to travel to the Netherlands over land to cut the CO2 or and I, I like in terms of products I like this sort of cradle to cradle principle that we do so extremely little of it is that when at the start of a sort of a, a product you already look at the end of that life cycle of the product so if I design it this way, what does it actually mean when I when when it's at its end and how can it be reduced? And I think in terms for us, for Ecofem, we really don't have the sort of the solutions for that right now. I mean, though we're in terms of uh, the pads, they're reusable for a very long time, but at the end, we still have this little leak-proof layer that is not compostable. And uh, so we always keep our eyes open for possibilities there, developments that could maybe bring that change. and. Um, yeah. Yeah, and um, my final question is: How would how do you foresee, or how would you like um, consumer behavior to sort of change post pandemic? I mean, I think that one thing for sure is that we will have to. I think. I think one thing has made this recognition that we live on a finite planet, and for sure, I think the economics is becoming you know, majorly sort of focused issue going forward. So I'd, I'd like to see everybody sort of realising, in a way, living a little bit more with the awareness that we are living on a resource-constrained, finite planet without unlimited resources, that we have to be responsible for that. So I would like to think that maybe that would translate into more people also looking for reusable everything, you know, how it's one, I think, very practical way where we can cut down our consumption of things is to choose reusable options over single use and throw options. So I, I, I hope that this has made us all, and, and perhaps things like the, the impact on, say, for example, municipal waste management over this period of time has made us perhaps all more conscious of that you know, what it's like to live in, a, you know, see more visibly and maybe 
become more aware of the growing mountain of non um, biodegradable waste that we're swimming in and to make more choices away from such products. That's one thing I think very obviously. You know, yesterday. Yeah, I mean, um, I don't know how really so feasible is it when we're all going back to our sort of maybe old lives. But I can see now that so many people having time at home are actually doing a lot of the things, new things at home and uh, discovering that they actually there's a lot that they can make and and they're enjoying that as well and and maybe feeling also empowered through that and uh, maybe that could also increase paths that people would make for themselves and be sort of happy happy with that yeah but i hmm. i don't know i think we're <laughs> a bit sort of pessimistic about i just i really hope that people sort of can keep it in mind what this actually brought them if when they are in a situation fortunate situation where they had the luxury to sort of enjoy the time that they suddenly got and to sort of see what the uh, gifts were that that time brought and that they can sort of somehow continue that in their post-COVID time. Yeah, sort of remember remember what life was like during this time and not not go back to like the old way of doing things or, or you know, like how people say things like business as usual, which I think is like the worst thing ever, but yeah. sort yeah, of remember. Uh, yes. No, exactly. I think that kind of would be the worst outcome of this yeah. time. Um, and I think too, you know, personally, I've really seen how slowing down has really, I think that's a, it's a deep change that I think is really also important, you know, just to not be so frenetic. Mm. And I think part of the massive consumption driven behaviour is also, you know, kind of filling holes and filling yeah, so I, I think that that's one thing too is just to really slow down enough to pay attention and, and notice. Yeah. I would love all of us to take the time to think about what this time meant to us and not to rush back to normal and to work. Most of us had to slow down and to think what this actually brought and um, what did we do new or spent more time on that really made us happy. And uh, can we continue that? And also to think about what this time of quiet brought the environment and could we somehow sustain that as well uh, and maybe maybe in different ways. I think that when most of us, when we're asked whether consumption makes us happy, we will we'll answer that it does not or not really. And um, this then is one front where we can really continue. It's not so hard not to buy uh, or to buy less. And when we do, is to do that sort of more consciously and choose for sustainable uh, products. Thank you so much. I realize that it's close to 3 p.m. now and I, and I know that you probably have other things to head off to and, and do lunch and yoga like we were joking about. Like, <laughs> 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 so I'm, I'm so happy that you found time for this. I'm so glad that, you know, our internet connectivity problems were relatively minor because I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much. Oh, good. It was my pleasure to, to speak to you and I really appreciate you taking this initiative and I realise with Amplify you're really trying to bring these more of these kind of voices out into the world. So I really just encourage you and appreciate what you're doing very much. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you so Thanks much. for reaching out and giving us the chance to speak with you. No worries. I'm so, I'm so happy that you found this time. This pleasure was entirely mine. of this week's episode thank you so much for tuning in you can find all the relevant links and handles to know more about our guests this week in the episode description if you have any feedback suggestions requests or simply just want to get in touch with us then please do head over to our podcast website we are available to flag and say hi to via facebook instagram or email thank you and see you next week